<laughs> oh, we were down a little bit early today, this morning. We were. We were. It was nice because it gave us plenty of time for, uh, for a fellowship with the Palm Bars before they uh, left here for the last time. Um, just go through a few announcements. I, one of the things we keep forgetting to do, David, is we keep forgetting to say anything about Flying W Ranch or that church picnic. The church picnic is not critical. Flying W Ranch is because we have to get tickets for that. And they are already sold out on a number of dates during the summer. So um, the day that we're looking at is July 23rd, which is the day after VBS is over. So work hard in VBS and then go play at Flying W Ranch for the afternoon and evening on the 23rd. Um, so just keep that in mind. I don't know whether that's going to work or not. We'll have to, once we decide how many you think they're going to be going, then we'll see where we can get tickets. Our first choice is the 23rd, but we'll see what happens. Um, we're looking at, at uh, Labor Day weekend, in fact, Labor Day, September 5th, uh, for our church picnic. So those are a couple things that we wanted to mention to you. We do have a missionary guest speaker next Sunday, and we did get housing for him. So we're grateful for that. Uh, the Freinez are going to keep him. And Jan has a sign-up sheet for meals, but that sign-up sheet is getting pretty full. Um, Saturday, Wednesday, and Friday. Okay, so. Well, that's the Friday night meal. Well, that's the Friday night meal. Oh, okay. So they can bake some cookies and we'll have some Friday night meal. When you say Friday night meal. Right now, we don't need it. We can mark off Friday night meal. There is a Friday night meal. It goes from and we don't need Saturday, correct? Um, oh, there is a Friday night in the talk. She's a good Okay, so if somebody wants to do Saturday, they can. But yeah, Friday, we can mark off Friday because they're not going to get here in time for a meal on Friday. Okay. So anyway, we, we, we're going to try to do meals for them. So if you can help us with that, we would appreciate it. Um, they're easy. They don't have uh, allerg food allergies. They like everything. Um, uh, there, he brought his nine-year-old up and said he even likes peanut butter and broccoli sandwiches. So, um, well, he didn't really say that, but but we tested him with it. He really doesn't have any three children. No, he doesn't. He has three children, and they're all boys. Uh, I don't know who it was, it was asking about that. It was Marina, wasn't it? Asking about that. Okay, keep praying for VBS and for Truth Trackers and keep giving to the AC project and keep signing up for stuff. We gotta clean this place and we need people to sign up to help us with that. We gotta mow this lawn once it starts growing and we need people to help us with that. And um, so, and I think probably the sign-up sheet for the ladies, the mother-daughter tea, which has been postponed until um, June because the May one, we got snowed out. I think that mother-daughter T sign-up will probably, you probably want to make sure that that's correct. That your name is on there if you're planning to go, and if it's not going to work for you, that you take your name off. We are going to do a church work day on June 11th. Um, that'll be an outside kind of a work day. I, I'm hoping to get quite a bit of work done around the church, including quite a bit of work done on the lawn. I'd like to aerate and um, um, maybe we can talk with the people who are supposed to be helping us with the lawn to see what kind of fertilizing work they're going to be doing and see if we can get them to do something after we aerate. Um, so there's some things that we would like to do around the church on the outside. We've got some work to do around the volleyball court as well. Uh, and then June 12th is our budget meeting. We're going to do that after the morning service. Um, we sometimes struggle to get a, a quorum at night. And in the summertime, that becomes even more of a challenge. If we had a business meeting tonight, for instance, we could not do it because we don't have a quorum. So we would, uh, we're going to do that after the morning service on the 12th. We have a couple of different financial items that we need to cover. All right, if you grabbed one of those sheets, <clears throat> we're going to wrap up our little series on what's wrong with. Um, as you can tell from the, from the um, title of that, that's a negative series. What's wrong with? What was wrong with gambling? 
what was wrong with sex outside of marriage, what was wrong with dancing, what was wrong with recreational alcohol, what was wrong with the, the, the movie and entertainment industry. So we talked about the things that are wrong, and um, on our introductory thing, we put in this thing about, it's on the back of your sheet here, so we're going to spend the bulk of our time tonight, the what's right about thing, the questions on that, and after I think the, the first one or maybe the second one, we started putting that on all of the other sheets as well, because um, what we really should be asking is, what are the biblical guidelines for how I ought to order my life? Not just, um, here's issue number 427 that has come into my life, and what's wrong with it? I mean, I, I remember growing up as a kid asking the questions, what's wrong with the prom? What's wrong with watching a movie on TV or going to the movies? What's wrong with dancing? What's wrong? And, and we always wanted that some, we challenged from the perspective, prove to me that this is wrong. Rather than asking the question, what does this do for me as a believer? So we'll talk about those questions here in just a minute. Um, we're going to stop this and move on to something else next week on the basis of the fact that you could go on and on and on. I mentioned question number 427. We didn't talk about pop culture. We didn't talk about swearing. You know, a lot of, it's amazing to me how many Christians curse. For a while, we even, even had a pastor up in the Northwest who was called the swearing pastor because he would curse during his sermons. So the idea of cursing has somehow lost its, by the way, that guy's out of the ministry now. Um, but it, it is, it is lost, some of these things have just lost their, the, the negative feel that believers always had toward them. Um, and we could have talked about that. We could have talked about LD, LGTBQA plus 297J, or whatever the latest thing is for that. Um, we could have talked about that. We could have talked about public education. Um, What's wrong with public education? What's wrong with uh, consumerism? What's wrong with gluttony? What's wrong with, and on and on and on we go. So there are all kinds of topics we could have covered. Um, we didn't go, we're stopping because I think really the point of this is to try to think about things from a biblical perspective, not think about things from a, from a cultural perspective. We tend to view this stuff from a cultural perspective. Um, the culture does all these things. My friends do all these things. My neighbors do all these things. If Jan and I were to, to sit in the middle of our neighbors and think left, across the street, across the diagonal, less diagonal, straight across the street, across the other street, well, I, I can't think of anybody who would have our perspective, our, our standards. They all do things that we would never touch. Some of them with children in the home. Some of them having grown up in Baptist churches. A couple of them. So um, the idea that, that we would follow the culture, which is a lot of what's happened in churches, is, is, uh, is really a dangerous perspective. What does the culture say? Let's just follow the culture in this thing. So um, let, let's come down to back in the day. Um, we, we, we have these little pithy statements, you know, we don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't run with the girls that do. Dry as a Baptist picnic. You ever heard that one? Uh, the idea behind that is everybody else has a picnic and they got booze, but not those Baptists. By everybody else, we mean the Episcopalians, the Catholics. I mean, they all got, and they have a picnic, band. there's lots of, Lots of alcohol, and it's flowing freely, and everybody's having a good time. And, but those Baptists, they, they just have a, Baptist, they have, they have a dry picnic. Um, and, you know, as we said earlier, it's not just the Baptists. There are a lot of people as Christians a century ago whose standards would have been very much um, more strict than they are today. 
And they, we think that these, we thought these were sins that every Christian ought to avoid. And, and yet, sometimes we can get very pharisaical, pharisaical and externally focused on this stuff. You're okay as long as you don't name it. Which is kind of how the Pharisees operated. If you don't do this or this or this or this or this, you're fine. We don't really care about these sins because these aren't the ones that are important to us. But these five or six or ten, the Pharisees, you know, this is what you have to do. And you have to obey the, not only the, the word of God, but you have to obey our traditions. So um, I, I remember, for instance, when, when we were um, younger and we would go off to camp, that um, if the camp allowed shorts, then there was a certain length those shorts had to be. And you'd, you'd have counselors and, and camp directors that, that had rulers. And they're measuring from the middle of the knee to where the end of that thing, and if it was a half inch shorter than what it's supposed to be, you had to, you had to go change, take those things off. Well, it's not in the Bible. I understand what they were trying to do. They're trying to stay modest. But um, sometimes we turn those things, the traditions of men, into gospel. And you don't do this. There's something desperately wrong with you. And uh, so we, we need to be very careful that we don't become just simply pharisaical and externally focused. But, but, the things we've been talking about often are marks of separation from the world. The world, for instance, talks about alcohol from the perspective that this is how you have a good time. In order for you to enjoy the holiday, you have to have booze. In order for you to enjoy the party, the party has to be um, alcoholic. In order for you to enjoy your vacation, you have to take this one. In order for the, the wedding to be positive, there has to be alcohol. And oh, by the way, there has to be dancing. And oh, by the way, there has to be... And you can start naming off a few other things. So um, there are marks of separation that we need to be thinking about. Do I, am I just going to look like the world or am I going to be different from the world? Mark? Right. Do I know why? What? What? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what you're talking about there is typically deep south. Yeah, uh, you know, um, there are there are some things that we that we talk about that aren't specifically mentioned in Scripture. We talked about even the kinds of dancing, the kinds of dancing that we do um, are not specifically mentioned in Scripture. Most of the alcoholic beverages that people drink today would not have been found in scripture um, they simply just weren't available um, so with smoking you're looking at a, a habit that has uh, it's not just a dirty nasty habit it is it is a habit that is destroying the body that God has given you and um, so we, we took a principle from scripture and say based upon this principle you shouldn't be doing that now what, what, what happens I think inside Christian circles and one of the reasons we get criticized is because there are some other habits that we do that also destroy the body, and we don't view those as sinful. Those are just fine. So we we um, we do th we, we we go out and we we get too much sunshine, and we get sunburned, and we you know we end up with skin cancer, and and people don't say that's sinful. They might say it's sinful depending on you know what kind of swimwear you're wearing in order to get your tan, but. Um, but we don't, we don't view that as sinful, and yet it is also destroying the body. So the principle, I think, is the thing that we should be looking at. What am I doing? Am I doing something that is, that is destructive to my, to my body? And that's the, that would be the principle that we're looking at with, with respect to smoking. Because the Bible doesn't really talk very much about smoking. Um, it talks about, um, does talk about your body, and that it's a temple of the Holy Spirit, and that we should take care of it but it doesn't talk about smoking specifically. And actually, that's, what, that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk, wrap this up tonight and get to what's on the back of the page, because our focus 
really needs to be um, what are the things that I should be doing that will draw me closer to the Lord? What are the things that I should be doing that's going to, we'll, we'll get to those here in just a second. So, um, a lot of these things are marks of separation from the world. A lot of them are boundaries, even though, as Mark just mentioned, they're not mentioned in Scripture. There's some boundaries that, have, that can help us stay true to our Savior. Again, we have to be careful with that because that's what the Pharisees did in order to not break the law, right? You can't, you can't um, hit a man with, um, you can't give him 40, 40 stripes, or more than 40 stripes. So they would stop at 39 to make sure that they hadn't miscounted and gone over 40. Um, you know, you can't do this and you can't do that according to Mosaic law. Well, they would say, well, you can't, you can't do this and this and this either because if you do those things, then, then you're breaking Mosaic law. Um, the, the leaven issues with respect to... Uh, um, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, that, that they would literally go through their houses and, and scour everything a week in advance. Well, the, the scripture doesn't say that. It doesn't say you have to do that. It just does, it says don't have leaven in your house. Um, at Passover or during the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so they would, they would say, okay, well, a week in advance, we got to go through, we got to go, and they would make games out of this stuff with their kids in order to make sure that by the time they got there, they didn't have any leaven in their house. Well, again, that's, that's fine. You're setting a boundary that helps to be sure that you don't do this. But if you make that a test of fellowship, you didn't go through a week in advance, um, then you're adding to Scripture. We need to be careful as, as believers, we don't do that. But there are some boundaries that we can set and just say, I'm not going there. Because if I go there, um, I, I'm going to be in, in real danger of uh, compromising my testimony, of, of drifting away from the Lord, those kinds of things. So um, whenever you talk about this stuff, we talked about this in, in our, in our uh, introduction, you're on, you're on thin ice because we're kicking at sacred cows. Um, people like this stuff. There's a reason that we get trapped in these things. It's a, it's a fishing analogy, but fish don't bite bare hooks. Fish bite hooks that have tasty little um, baits on them or look like they're tasty little baits. Um, I used to tell the kids in, in our youth group, I'm not going to try to pull your leg on this. Sin is fun. Sometimes it's a blast. Sometimes it, it, is, it is the most exciting and fun thing you're going to do. But it's got a deadly hook in it. You need to understand that the fact that it's fun doesn't make it good. The fact that it's fun doesn't make it right. And, um, and yet a lot of people enjoy this. I mean, people go up to gamble because they like the thrill of it. People drink the alcohol because they like the buzz. Most, you know, most people that I've talked to who, who drink, and in a particular beer, will tell you, I don't really like the taste. I like the buzz. The taste is, eh, whatever. Those old commercials where, tastes great, less filling, tastes great. Uh, most of the guys that I would talk to would say, yeah, the taste great thing is <laughs> not so much. Uh, maybe it's less filling, uh, but beer doesn't always taste all that great. And, and in fact, for most people, I think the one that tastes the best is probably wine because it has that fruity flavor to it. But it's, it's not a matter of, of how, how great it tastes. It's a matter of the buzz that you get from it. So, but there are hooks, and you're kicking at sacred cows, and somebody can get mad. People can get mad. People did get mad. Um, over some of the things we talked about over this series. In fact, when I started this, Jan looked at me and said, are you ready for this? Do you really want to get into this? Um, you know people are going to kick back at this. And I said, I know. I just feel like the Lord wants me to say, maybe we should stop and take a look because the rest of the Christian world is saying, no, we shouldn't take a look. In fact, pastors in our fellowship of churches won't touch this stuff. They won't talk about it. Some of them will say this, the very things that we've talked against, and they'll say it from their pulpits. 
So um, those are some of the things we've talked about. One, one more thing before we get into the back page. The standard should be God's word, not our traditions. And we have our own traditions. We, we um, take shots at the Catholic Church and the Lutherans and everybody else because they have their traditions. We have our own traditions. And there are times when our traditions become, in our mind, gospel. We need to be careful about that. Um, if it's a tradition, uh, something that we have done because um, it's, it's sort of just how we've always done it, then there's nothing wrong with doing something like that. There's nothing wrong with a tradition. But if that tradition becomes gospel and becomes the, the point of, of what's right and what's wrong, then we've stepped over a line and we have become pharisaical. So we need to be careful about that. Um, there is reason for us to be distanced from the culture. The church has always been, when the church, I should say it this way, when the church has been effective, it has always been countercultural. The church has never been effective when it, when it acquiesces to the culture. When the church becomes like the culture around it, it ceases having an effective um, ministry for the cause of Christ. When the church is countercultural, when it stands against the culture, particularly the things in the culture that are sinful or that draw us away from the Lord, that's when the church is effective. I was talking with Alex today, and he said, it's interesting, the time we spent in, in California, most of the Christians that we knew out there were much more outspoken about their faith than a lot of the Christians that, I, that we know around here or in other places that we have been uh, posted and yet, the culture out there is so antagonistic to Christianity that even though they are outspoken about their faith, um, they rarely make, at least it, it doesn't appear on the outside that they're making much of an impact. Um, and they, they, his comment was, well, you don't make many friends that way. Well, they're not trying to make friends, and he wasn't saying that they should be. He was just saying that the culture distances itself from biblical Christianity and biblical Christianity should be okay with that distance when the culture is moving farther and farther and farther away from the Lord we should be okay with that distance from the culture and let me say this too the distance it, it shouldn't be like this culture Christians culture Christians culture Christians so now here we're where the culture used to be that shouldn't be how this works we should be founded, solid on God's word. And what, what our principles are should stay there. I, I, you know, recognize, um, I, I don't dress like Peter did. Peter didn't wear a coat. I don't think Peter had any shirts that, that honored 1776. Um, so there are things that are cultural that it's, it's okay for us to be acclimated to the culture in that regard. But we need to be careful that when the culture steps farther away from God, that we don't say, well, we're maintaining this distance from the culture, so it's okay for us to step a little farther away from God as well. And unfortunately, a lot of times that's what we do. Uh, this is a quote, we've so allowed the culture to taint us that we can't discern truth. Historically, the trend is always to loosen, and I put always in italics and bold because it's, it is a it is one of those um, points of, how do, how do I say that? It, it, is, it is one of those things that, that is, a, is, a, is, is a truism. I'm not saying this correctly, but this, it, the, the trend is always to loosen our standards and commitment until a seismic shift brings us back to a biblical perspective. So think of Old Testament Israel. What happened with Solomon? He gradually, because of the marriages he got involved with, he gradually drifted away from God. Israel gradually drifted away from God. It's, it doesn't seem as gradual to us because we read this and then we read the next chapter, which is 40 or 50 years later, and it seems like it was the next day, right? It wasn't the next day. It was, it was a lot of time hundreds of years transpired 
and Israel's gradually drifting away from God. Historically, we don't drift toward God. We historically drift away from God. Prone to wander, the hymn says. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Not prone to get more like the God I love. That takes work. It's easy to drift. It's hard to stay true. And so part of the reason for doing this is because you want to throw up a, uh, um, a warning sign with respect to the concept of drift. And the, the seismic thing with Israel that brought them back to a reality with respect to idolatry in particular was captivity. What cured Israel of captivity was being taken, or of, of idolatry was being taken into captivity in the heart of human idol worship, Babylon. That's what cured them. Um, that seismic shift said, okay, we went too far. And we need to come back to God. Now, what happened after they came back to God? A few hundred years went by, and they drifted again until you got to the time of Jesus, and the Pharisees are all about politics, and they're all about um, their own perspective, and they're robbing widows, and I mean, it's, it's an ugly scene by that time. All right, before we get into this next section, any comments or questions on that first part? It's a little bit of a rehash of our introduction, but there's some other things I wanted to throw in there that just to, just to think in terms of why we went through the things we did. All right, let's go through some of these scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. The word edify means to build up, to make me stronger. And so the question here is, will the thing that I am thinking about, will this benefit me spiritually? So will it benefit me spiritually to be involved in gambling. Let's just, we'll take that one. Will it benefit me spiritually to go along with the culture and, and what the culture is doing with all the LGBTQ stuff? Will those things benefit me spiritually? Name the issue that you're dealing with. Will it benefit me spiritually? Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Some of the things that I could do aren't helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not, not all of this, thing, this stuff will build me up as a believer. Not all things will benefit me. So will this thing that I'm contemplating, will it be a benefit to me? And that's the point of what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Next question, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Yes, go ahead, Samuel. Okay, just a second. We're, we're recording. Didn't, didn't know we'd be able to do this, but we are. So I got a question saying, uh, you are saying gambling is, 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 not, is, not, is not good for a believer to follow. Uh, suppose I go and uh, gamble or take that uh, proceed. Maybe I, I won a lottery and and uh, uh, did something good for, I mean, for God's word. Let's say build a church or do something. Will God, wouldn't God accept that? So that was your question, and I was like, well, you had to go by what does God say about gambling? And he's not, God is not, it's not a person that you will, like, Rob them with phone or money and say, look, I did this, but now I can certify you with my phone. So um, I don't know what, what do you think about that. Are you familiar with the, the phrase Jesuit sophistry? Jesuit sophistry says it is okay to do wrong if it is in the pursuit of something that is right. 
So it's okay to do something that is wrong if you're pursuing something else that is greater, that is right. So you can sin, you can gamble, if you're saying to yourself, if I win a million dollars, I'm going to help the church build a new building. Okay? Um, the Jesuits have built their, kind of their philosophy of how things ought to be done um, around that thought. The question that I would have is, is it ever right to do wrong in order to get a chance to do right? And my answer to that would be, and I, I would see this in Scripture, no. In fact, let's, let's go straight to, to, to the Bible and let's talk about Saul. God told Saul, go fight against the Amalekites. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you to win this battle. And what I want you to do is I want you to wipe them out. I don't want you to leave anyone, any Amalekite standing when it's done. I don't want you to take any of the spoil. I want all of that devoted to destruction because of what the Amalekites did to Israel when they came out of Egypt. So I want you to punish Amalek. And Saul went out and defeated Amalek killed all the people except the king killed all the livestock except the livestock that were good enough for sacrifices and then he blamed the people he said well the people talked me into doing this so what Saul did is exactly what you're talking about Saul said I will do something that is wrong in order and that's to spare some of the the sheep and the oxen and, and the king of Amalek, in order to get a chance to do something that's right. I don't know why he spared the king, but um, but because he wasn't going to sacrifice him, but he was going to sacrifice the sheep and the oxen. So I'm going to do something wrong in order to get a chance to do something right. That's Jesuit sophistry, and it's anti-biblical. Saul's experience and Samuel's response has the Lord as much interest in sacrifice as he does in obedience. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So what he was saying was your desire to sacrifice, as good as that is, should be tied to obedience. When it's tied to disobedience, it makes the sacrifice of no value. So that would be, that would be my answer. Cherry? Saul was only willing to sacrifice at somebody else's expense. These animals were not his. He was not actually giving God anything. You compare that with David, who refused to offer a sacrifice that he had paid nothing for. Right, I just read that passage. And he insisted, if I sacrifice to God, it's going to be a sacrifice from me. And you can see the, cha the difference in the heart there. Yeah, yeah, there is a difference in the heart. I mean, I, I know what Saul would argue. Saul would argue, well, it cost me something. I had to go to battle to, to, and win the battle in order to get these. Um, so it did cost me something, but it didn't cost him something. So, All right, next one. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. That sounds familiar. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Will this bring bondage? You hear a lot of, of uh, gambling commercials today. You know, um, can't lose. Um, gamble this. If you win, you win. If you lose, you get $200 in free bets. You can just keep right on gambling. And then they say, um, if you have a gambling problem, call 1-800 and they've got a number. You know. um, they're, they're actively trying to create a gambling problem. That's what they're doing with the advertising, with the free bets. They're trying to create in you a habit. Um, not everybody will do that. In fact, you, you'll, you're here, we played the, the clip of, of uh, um, the Mannings talking about, you, you know, you need to set a limit, you need to be careful that you, that you only take so much money and you use that money and that's all you use and 
You, you just need to, it's, it's for entertainment purposes. It's not for purposes of trying to get rich. Baloney. People don't go to gamble just to be, gamble just to be entertained. They go to win. In fact, in the advertisements, that's what they say. Loose slots. You know, you've got the one-armed bandit, but that one-armed bandit is a great way for you to win money. Um, you can play the scratch stuff. Uh, so we have a dilemma at our house. Jan just retired, and one of the gifts that she got was two lottery tickets. Now, we didn't buy them, so we're going to scratch them, see what's there. But, um, but, but when they came, we looked at each other and said, we just talked about this. <laughs> uh, so the, the, issue of, the, the issue of will this create bondage, as, as a matter of fact, I, I think I shared with you that I did that chuck puck thing with Darren. When that thing dropped on the dot, the first thought that went through my mind was, oh, no. Not, oh, boy, we won. Oh, no. We won. Now what do I do? What have I done to my son? Have I created in him a desire for this? It was a dollar. The chance that we were going to win was one in a bazillion. I mean, he's going to throw it over. He can barely clear the glass with this thing. And it rolls right out there and drops in a dot. And I just, I could just, in my mind's ear, I could hear God saying, okay, so now what are you going to do? <laughs> it's kind of it's like the guy who, the pastor who says, I'm skipping church and I'm playing golf, and he hits a hole in one. And, and the angel says to God, why did you let him do that? And he, the, God says to the angel, who's he going to tell? So is it going to create bondage? And a lot of these things will create bondage. Alcohol often, not always, but often puts a person in bondage to that. Smoking, you mentioned smoking. It is a bondage issue. Um, and by the way, the people who talk about getting rid of smoking, stopping smoking, will say that the physical challenge of stopping smoking is overcome within a couple of days. The psychological addiction to smoking often takes weeks in order for a person to overcome that. So it, it was, am, I, am I going to become addicted to this? Drugs, um, pornography, you, you name the issue that a lot of people will say, that's ah, not that big of a problem. It is a problem. And uh, the, the, the po potential to become addicted. It's a hand. All right, um, Romans 6, 13. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And then 1 Corinthians, you know what? I'm, that's a good verse for that, but that's not the one I meant to, re to read. Romans chapter 6. Verse 13. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So my body should be used for God, not for the satisfaction of pleasure. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Here's the, the, the verse that's often used with respect to smoking and other things that will do damage to our bodies physically. Who is in you, whom you have from God, and, who, and, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. I don't belong to me. I am bought, purchased, and, and paid for. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Romans 12, um, see you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. This whole idea that, that uh, Christianity is all about the spirit but has nothing to do with the body is just simply not scriptural. My, bo my body is where my spirit resides, and my body is what belongs to God. My spirit as well, but my body belongs to God. 
particularly when I've trusted Christ as my Savior, I am now a child of God, purchased with the blood of Christ. So is, is this something that will defile God's temple? Will it cause someone else to, str- to stumble? 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You notice how many of these are in 1 Corinthians? There's a reason for that, because the Corinthian church was having so much trouble with all these different things that they came in with as, as people who lived in one of the most sensual cities in, in ancient Roman Empire. And they came into the church with all these sensual desires. And Paul's having to deal with all this stuff. And so it keeps cropping up in this book of 1 Corinthians. The questions are asked, and he keeps coming back to those. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But be, beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Will it cause someone else to stumble? Now, what we're talking about food here, typically the, the, the issue that Paul is talking about is food offered to idols. So you have... You're, you're living in an idolatrous town. You go to the market. There is food in the market that's hanging there, and you purchase the food and then recognize that this has been offered to an idol as a sacrifice and has been brought to the market to be sold. So just a few moments ago, it was offered to name your Roman god. And it was offered as a sacrifice, and so then it's brought to the market. And Paul's talking about that in here. What about this food? Well, for Jewish believers, this was really tough. Like, how can I eat this stuff? It was offered to an idol. Food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours, they were at liberty to use that food. It was not against the law of Christ to eat the food that had been offered to an idol, as long as you weren't participating in the, in the idolatrous worship. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. So is it not going to cause someone else to stumble? 1 Corinthians 10, verses 32 and 33. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks, or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And so Paul is saying, I'm going to order my life in such a way that my life is a testimony to other people, and they may come to Christ. When I go to lunch with these guys that I play hockey with, there will be alcohol on the table. From time to time, one of them will get um, cute and offer to buy me one. Want a beer stand? How about a Manhattan? I don't even know what's in a Manhattan. Some of these days I need to say, does that have a skyscraper? You know, what's the deal? What, how, what do you call it a Manhattan? What is the deal with that? Just to show them, I don't really even know what this stuff is. Staying away from that is a testimony. If I were to say yes, they would rejoice because they would be bringing me to their level. They would be saying, good, you're like us. We don't have to even think about um, these other things that you stand for. By By staying pure from that stuff, my testimony stays pure. I have the opportunity and have had the opportunity to talk to some of those guys about Christ. I wish I could say a lot of them have come to Christ. That hasn't been the case. But... At least that's there. Who knows what will happen? Romans 14, verse 23. And we're going to have to wrap up this up pretty quick because we're actually coming up toward 7 o'clock. And I'm getting hot. Ah, that's too much work. Verse 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatsoever is not, whatever is not from faith is sin. All right, so I think I will do that. But I have to grab the mic because it's on the coat. So, um, I'm going to put this. Time to get it all turned around. That's good. That's going to work that way even though it's upside down. 
Um, No, I, that, I, that's true. Thank you. But of course you unless I feel guilty, in which case it's not a faith. <laughs> he who doubts is condemned if he, because if he does not eat from because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So I, l- let me just let me just say, the first time I went to the theater was to watch Star Wars. There was no skin. There was no cursing. There is that underlying duality, you know, there's the, the good and the evil, and they're basically equal, and um, you, had, you had that that theological trash that's a part of Star Wars. Um, but I'm telling you, I walked in that theater, and my conscience was killing me. It was just killing me. Now, there's more to the, to the problem, because I'd already also signed something for the college, for the seminary, saying that I would not do this. And so, I was actually disobeying something that I had signed. But my conscience was killing me. Was, was it necessarily sin to go watch, watch Star Wars? Not in and of itself, but it was sin for me. Number one, because I had signed something saying I shouldn't do it. Whether you think that was right for them to put that out there or not is irrelevant. I signed it. And number two, because my conscience, even if I hadn't signed that, my conscience would have been bothering me because we grew up, you don't go to movies. So my conscience was bothering me. I needed, Jan and I will occasionally go to the theater now. It's been probably a year or longer since we've been, we just don't go very often and we're very selective. We've thought about going to this 2,000 Mules and seeing that, I don't even know if it's still in the theater now. But... Um, we arrived at a, at a position, a theological position on the basis of, and on the basis of that decided it's okay for us to do this um, selectively. That's what I should have done rather than saying, I have a problem with this and I'm going to go anyway because by doing that it was sin. So what is not of faith is sin. If I think this is wrong, I shouldn't be doing it. If in doubt, don't. And that's what this verse is saying. If you have doubts about that, if it's bothering your conscience, let your conscience guide you and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Even if your conscience is misinformed at this particular point, allow your conscience to tell you no, until such time as your conscience is better informed. You want to say it that way. And then the last one is 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So can I do this activity I'm contemplating and lift my eyes to heaven and say, I am doing this to bring glory to you? You know, I appreciate there are some athletes in, at the professional level Uh, and, in, and at the, the Division I college level, and I mean, the levels where we are seeing them on television after the fact, and they'll, they will win, score the winning goal or the winning touchdown or hit the home run or whatever, and they'll, they'll come back on afterwards and they will talk about living their lives and playing their sport to the glory of God. I appreciate that. We may not agree on a lot of theolog- other theological stuff, but what they're saying is, even in the sport that I play, whether I'm doing it at the amateur level and it's still for fun, or whether I'm doing it at the professional level and it's my job, the sport that I play, I play to the glory of God. So if something goes well and people want to talk to me about it, I'm going to give God the glory. That's what this verse is saying. If you eat, if you drink, whatever it is you do, your work, your leisure, your work in the yard, at home, your service to the Lord at church, your lunch with pagan guys around hockey, your whatever it is that you do, do all to the glory of God. My life should be lived to honor Christ. And if the thing that I am contemplating will not honor Christ or will dishonor Christ, 
I should say no. So the point of all this is to evaluate questionable things on the basis of the Word of God. Not on the basis of our traditions, because our traditions can be wrong. Not on the basis of what the culture is doing, because the culture often is wrong. But on the basis of the Word of God and in light of my walk with Christ. All right, that's what I have for tonight. What, what questions do you have? Or what thoughts do you have to share as we wrap this up? Mark is ready with a microphone. Abraham actually went farther than some than we do sometimes. Uh, when he was getting ready to bury Sarah, he was offered a piece, piece of land free. And he said, no, I won't do that. I will purchase it. When he came back from the slaughter of the kings and brought Lot back home, the kings offered to give him every, all the bounty, all the, everything. He said, no. His particular reason in that case was, I will not let anyone think that the king of Sodom, whose place I hate and all that, that the king of Sodom made me rich. So he, he didn't just stop at, at not doing things that were obvious. He did some other things sort of behind the scenes that God honored him for it. He said he walked by faith. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we, we need to be a little deeper in our thinking. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think a lot of times, a lot of times the, the, the decision to do something is pretty shallow in, our, in the way we think about that. Um, I think I'm going to enjoy this. Um, my friends are doing this. I don't know anybody who thinks that it's wrong. I'm not thinking about my church family, but I'm thinking about everybody else. That I don't think it, no, if, if I don't do this, people are going to think I'm a prude. Whatever the, the reasons might be, they can often be pretty shallow. So I think you're right. Abraham was trying to think of who am I before God in these decisions. It would have been you think about having slaughtered these kings and all the people that were with them and and the the um, the, the uh, what do they call that spoils. the spoils thank you the spoils that they brought back would have been in those days would have been an enormous um, bounty for Abraham he just said no I'm not going to go there Mark speaking of spoils etc it's taken me um, until the last several years to figure out that what we give to God, at least in the Old Testament, the sacrifices were taken to the temple, slaughtered, cooked, and eaten there by the, the people who brought them. And Saul was bringing stuff back that he was supposed to have destroyed as a, a total sacrifice to God, a, a sacrifice of obedience. And I think, looking at it now, what he'd done was allowed the people to get sacrifices that they hadn't earned, really. I mean, they'd earned, but they weren't authorized to have. And then they were going to get to eat it, and it was sort of like Saul bribing them with what should have been totally God's. And I have no doubt that the people said to Saul, why don't we bring these back and sacrifice them to the Lord? I have no doubt that that, that, that happened. When, when, Paul, when, when Saul said, um, the people said this to me, and I... I, I just let the people, that's probably true, but what that demonstrated was weakness on Saul's part. He was not, he, he didn't, he was willing to allow the sheep to tell the shepherd what to do. And he was supposed to be the shepherd who took his orders from God. He was supposed to be the shepherd that said, no, we can't do that. I mean, multiple times in David's life, people came to him and said, this seems really reasonable to me and we should do it. And David said, nope, that's not reasonable. That is not godly. We're not going to do it. Here's Saul. God's given him into your hands. Doesn't that sound logical? He's in the cave. He's all by himself. You could kill him and nobody will even know it. Nope, not going to happen. He's in a deep sleep from the Lord. And, and you're right here in the middle. You could just, just let me, one stab is all it's going to take. I won't miss. I know where the heart is. It's, just, it's all it'll take. One stab. He won't utter a noise. And we can get out of here. And David just, nope, that's not. This is Saul. Saul is God's anointed. I will not lift my hand against God's anointed. 
And not only did he, would he not do that, when someone else said he had, he killed him. Because he admonished him. How dare you? Even when the person was his bitter enemy, which was true in both cases, Saul was his enemy, Ishbosheth was his enemy. And he killed both of the people. The, the first guy, I don't think, did that to Saul. Because what the, what the Bible says is that, that Saul fell on his sword and died, and when his armor bearer saw that he was dead, then he killed himself. And this guy came along and said, well, I came upon Saul, and he was leaning on his spear. It wasn't his spear, it was a sword. He was leaning on his spear, and his life was still fully in him. No, that's not what Scripture says happened. So he's trying to make it sound as if he's the one who finished Saul off, and I should be rewarded for that. Well, David took him at his word. Probably wasn't the And by the way, I don't know if you ever, if, if that ever dawns on you, the guy was... Uh, an Amalekite. <laughs> yeah, so David is saying, yeah, it's strike two, and that's all you get. So, All right, anybody else? Well, I hope this is profitable. Um, I, don't, I don't want us as a church family to be legalistic, and I use that word carefully because it's so overused and misused today. Talk about misinformation. Concepts of legalism are so far out of bounds. Um, but I don't want us to be pharisaical. I don't want us to be just traditional. I don't want us to say this is wrong because it's always been wrong. I want us to look at the Word of God. And I, I want us to have a sense of what does the Bible say about this. Our position has changed on, on a few things over the years. Um, it's not exactly what it was when I first came out of college. That said, um, we, we have tried to be very careful that those changes are on the basis of what we understand the Word of God to be saying. And um, so hopefully that will be the standard that we'll use. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. Thank you for coming tonight, by the way, a Sunday night on a holiday weekend. I appreciate that. And you might pray for the people who are traveling. Um, Chuck and Jen were hoping to be back in time for the birth of the baby. And by the way, Brian and Vicki are home. The light treatment did work for the belly Reuben issue that they were experiencing with the baby. And they are home, and the baby's doing fine, mama's doing fine, everybody's back in their own beds, and they're just tickled pink. Um, in the baby's case, tickled not yellow. So, um, but Chuck and Jen were, Jen in particular, were not, was not happy about having missed the, the blessed event. and. Part of their problem was that they were around Archie, who they think had pink eye. And they didn't feel like they should be coming home until they were sure that they did not have pink eye. They want to come home and spread that to the rest of the family, in particular a brand new baby. So um, they'll be traveling. Uh, these folks are coming back from Iowa. I know that Donald is back in the state, but he was, you know, he was going to try to make it for tonight. And he said, he texted me and said, my flight's been delayed out of Denver and I won't get back in time. Um, so he and Milton and and uh, Madeline and uh, Hulls, um, all of them are traveling back from there. Um, um, well, I think there's just a lot of people that aren't. That yeah, are, Tustin's are helping Jenna move 